Good evening, good evening, good evening. I want to thank you guys for tuning in to Damon Looks um, Walk and Personal. Walk in, pers in Purpose with Angela. I'm sorry. Walk in Purpose with Angela. Um, a part of Ngozi Time Multimedia. Um, this is an extension of our monthly radio show that um, airs on Blog Talk Radio. Um, you can catch me on fourth Wednesday of each month um, at 9.30 p.m. But we are on nightly um, just the hosts are only on um, once a month, um, but the show is on nightly. Again, I will be on the 23rd, um, and I was the first host on the network to reach a million listeners. So I'm super excited about that. If you've not tuned in to my show, please tune in. Um, the next show is going to be September the 23rd. I have two amazing guests that are going to be coming on and sharing their journey to walking in purpose. But tonight we are here on Damon Looks and I am here with um, an amazing young man. Um, I'm going to allow him to come on and share just a little bit about who he is. But I tell you, he's an amazing young man. I had the opportunity to meet him through a phone conversation. Um, actually, one of my sister friends, um, Vanessa Abrams, um, she shared him with me. And um, I was super excited to meet this young man. So I am super excited to share you guys with him on tonight. Um, I tell you, he's amazing. He's an author. He does a lot um, around mental illness. And um, tonight, he's going to be sharing um, a little about suicide with us and a little about himself. So I'm going to bring him up so he can introduce himself. Hello. Hi, thank you for having me. So um, just to give a little background, my name is Tempers Gaskew. I am a co-author in the book Men and Mental Health, Volume 2, Series 3. And for me, why I'm so passionate about mental health is because of my own journey. Um, and just to dive a little deeper into my background, I am a member of the National Alliance for Mental Illness in North Carolina. I am a co-facilitator for the CIT trainings, which is crisis intervention team trainings for police officers and sheriffs to better understand how to deal with individuals with mental health and to initiate the rehabilitation process versus them being incarcerated when that's not necessarily what they need. And as well as that, I'm currently actually running for the state board of the National Alliance in mental, on Mental Illness within my state. And so um, just continuing my work and my efforts in mental health as it relates to wellness and education and building equity and things of those um, things of that nature. And so I just look to partnerships um, with Vanessa, as she said, as well as being able to meet Angela and to continue to network with individuals that truly understand the importance of mental health and suicide prevention. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got distracted. No, you're fine. <laughs> I, th you, I thought you was going to go, 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 go. Cause I, I you, was, but I wanted it to be more natural conversation. You, <laughs> you have a lot um, mm -hmm. going on. And um, yes. I really want people to know a little about you. I know you're a co-author to an amazing mm -hmm. um, collaboration. Um, if you could share just a little bit about that and how that plays a part in all that you're doing. Okay. Um, so for me, the book, Men and Mental Health, um, literally what happened was I was tagged in a post um, from Vanessa Abrams, um, a mutual friend of mine, um, followed her. And so they tagged me in the post and we had the initial conversation about the book and what the requirements were. And when she told me that it was about men and African-American men specifically was the target audience for this book, I knew it was time for me to share my story of mental health, depression, anxiety, as well as um, 
suicide attempt and being a survivor. And so for me, the book was really about the advocacy and the importance of men being able to finally share their story because I think that's what was missing from a lot of literature. And sometimes as men were taught to um, be so secluded and to just deal with things and to not process, we're not allowed the same, um, the same comforts or resources all the time. And some, I felt like it was necessary to begin to have the conversation and just to inspire other individuals to speak up about mental health and what they've been through to get to a place of wellness, tranquility and purpose and for people to better understand what mental health looks like from a holistic approach because sometimes in our community we either self-medicate using um, drugs whether that's alcohol or other substances and things of that nature um, or we don't always seek the help that we need and so there becomes a lot of toxic behavior and traits and so for me, once I was diagnosed um, in 2018, I knew it was time to begin my advocacy. Um, hence is where the National Alliance on Mental Illness came into play of me joining. And then from there, it just kind of took off of me continuing to speak, continuing to advocate, being the team captain of fundraising for the three counties that we represent and just really learning the importance of mental health and meeting great individuals such as Vanessa and yourself and being able to continue my platform. And it was important to me because I looked at it that every day that I didn't share my story was another day that some individual was still in bondage because I was silent. And and so it just became necessary to me that I, I just couldn't um, to have been afforded the opportunity to still be breathing I just couldn't continue to keep my mouth shut. And um, it, it's it's kind of ironic how I got involved because it's it's been mm -hmm. something that I've always wanted to do, but I've always kept saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to get involved. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get involved. Like with a lot of people, we, we, we constantly say we're going to do something and we constantly put it off. Right. But I tell you, when it hit home, when mm -hmm. suicide, when 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 I lost my cousin, I had three um, family members that committed suicide within the same month in 2017. Now, I remind you, I am also a suicide attempt survivor. My first attempt was in 1991, but nobody really knew that I had been attempting suicide with my life because it's not something that we talk about. You know, we don't talk about certain things in our family it's just in the right. brown community people have told you because yes. they say that mm -hmm. we're supposed to be so strong we've been taught mm -hmm. for years that we're supposed to be strong this is what we're supposed to do and we're not supposed to seek outside help we're not supposed to be going to people well i remember i suffered for over 15 years before i even knew i was battling with depression i didn't know mm -hmm. what it was because when you don't know what something is you can't give it a name so all right. oh, you know is that you're sleeping more or you're distracted yeah. or just you Don't know little things that begin to add up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean it, it added up. I mean the, I, I I wouldn't understand in the weight gain, then the weight loss. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it was it was crazy because I've been average size most of my life, and when my mom passed, it's like I blew up like a balloon, mm -hmm. literally. And it seemed like every time I was going through something, my weight would fluctuate. And mm -hmm. me really not understanding, me really not understanding. But mm -hmm. I thank God that finally, um, I ended up um, going through a domestic violence incident. And going mm -hmm. through the domestic violence incident, I was diagnosed with PTSD. And being diagnosed with PTSD, they also diagnosed me with depression and a couple of more things. Um, so I finally started getting my mental health in check. You know, I right. found out, you know, all these things, you know, and they wanted to start giving me all these different medications because I mm -hmm. wanted to take the natural 
way. I wanted to go the natural way. I didn't want to take all the medication. So I thought maybe if I go see a psychiatrist, I go see, um, seek counseling, um, see therapists, um, go to these um, meetings that they have. Um, so I went through the 12 step program, you know, didn't realize that, you know, I was going to find out a whole lot of stuff about me. That I <laughs> no, absolutely. It's, it's about self-discovery yeah. what's going on. You know mm. what I'm saying? And there are a lot of people out there. Um, we do have another guest. Um, I posted um, because I wanted people to, to come on and share. So there's a young lady. Mm. Um, she's a school teacher. Um, um, she's also, um, into poetry and, um, she wanted to come on. She, she commented on the post and she wanted to come on and share. So I want to give her the opportunity, um, to come on and conversate with us and chat with us, but mm-hmm. we're not going to forget about your book. We're going to let you come back and you're gonna <laughs> talk about your book and share okay. your links. Um, so people mm-hmm. can um, find out about that book because that book is an amazing book. Um, I've seen it all okay. over Facebook. I hadn't had a chance to um, get it yet, but I'm going to get it. Um, but I've seen it all over Facebook. And I want to mm-hmm. tell you that I am proud of you. And thank you. Um, thank you for stepping out on faith and stepping out and being transparent so that others can be healed. Um, and that's what it's all about. Um, so I thank Absolutely. you for that. I'm going to bring our other guest on and let her share just a little bit about who she is. And we're going to jump into the conversation. Hey, lady, how you doing today? You're on mute. We can't mm-hmm. hear you. Oh, okay, can I you all hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay. Hi, how are you, you all? Get a better look of us. No, they probably don't think I'm crazy, but I want to see. I want to really see us. There you go. I'm that's going, okay, that's that's better. You think that one was better? That one yes, okay, I think this one's better. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Miss Cassandra, tell us a little bit about who you are. Oh wow. Okay. Um, I was just joining in to hear the conversation and tune in if I needed to, but uh, my name's Cassandra. Um. I'm originally from St. Louis, Missouri. Um, I currently stay in North Carolina. Um, and um, I am a school teacher. I'm an author. Um, I, I published my first book um, last year. I'm working on another book. I just came out with like a collab, but um, with another, a whole bunch of other authors, but I'm working on my actual second book. And um, I too am a suicide attempt survivor. So. Yeah, so you can give us some insight, and it's and no coincidence because both of you guys are from North Carolina, and um, right. I, and I have a list of questions myself, and, um, <laughs> connect as well. Because mm-hmm. I know, as a school teacher, this is something that you probably did. I know you deal with, um, mm-hmm. I, I know it's something that you have to deal with, um, and and we just want to get um, some perspective so that we can share. Um, with those that are tuned in today and those that may be on the verge, because you never know what the next person is thinking and what people mm-hmm. are going through. Because I tell you, I wore a mask for years. I could have just yeah. been just attempted and people don't even know. They thinking everything OK and not even knowing what I'm going through. You know, a lot of people here in this now probably they, they probably hear my story for the first time. You know, because it's not something that I've shared in a lot of my books. You know, you know, I share bits and pieces of my testimony. I haven't really got Mm -hmm. into the grit and and, and dealt to people to really understand. But this journey has not been easy. But I thank God for this journey because it has allowed me to meet amazing people like you guys to share your story. Because I tell you, he don't give us these books for nothing. He give us these messages Mm -hmm. so that we can help other people that may be going through um, whatever it is. And this month is Suicide Awareness Month. And I just wanted to bring awareness because this has affected my family. And I know if it has affected my family, it's affected billions of families across this world. And Mm -hmm. it's time that we take a stand. You know, we keep turning the left, left cheek to this and left cheek to that. It's time to take a stand on all the things that are affecting our brown community. It's time that we talk about these things and not let these things continue to affect our communities like they are. So I wanna thank you guys for coming on today. 
um, true talk truth series is on watching us, and they said hello, amen. Um, so, um, who want to dive into the conversation? Why do y'all think that this topic is really not touched on in our homes, in our brown community? Why do you think it's such taboo? Why do you think that um, we have to be weak if we seek um, counseling? Why Why do they feel that we are weak if we cry? Because I'm a crybaby, and I don't care who know it. I cry all the time. Y'all might see me sitting over here. I might start crying during this broadcast. That's just me. I hadn't always, I have not always been like that, though, because I've had, there's been dark times in my life. And during those dark times, I put up a wall. I didn't want people to know nothing about me. I wouldn't cry. I wouldn't, I would, you speak to me, I might bite your neck off. That's, that's the type of person I was. But that was during the dark times in my life. So I, I, I just want, whatever y'all want to talk about, I, I just want to talk about it so people can be educated, empowered, and encouraged tonight. I think that uh, one of the main things is that as a society, as a race, as a culture, uh, we just sweep those things under the rug that uh, we feel will bring a, will shine a bad light on us as an individual, us as a people. I mean, even as a school teacher and having to go through like suicide training each year. And I work in a high school. And so some of the um, traits and the characteristics that I see in the students I think it's a lot easier for me to recognize it because at that age, well, not really at that age, because I tried to commit suicide. I was 19 um, years old, so I was out of high school. But um, the withdrawing, the withdrawing from the crowds, and you know, the anger, like you spoke of, Angela. Um, I mean, there are so many things that happen in our community, and not just you know, like suicide, but like domestic violence and molestation and things like that and we try to sweep them under the rug because we feel as if if someone knows that this is going on in our lives or if someone knows this is going on within our family and then it makes us look like bad parents or bad people or things like that and i think that uh, one of the main things is that remember that you know um i mean even of course we tell people all the time you know well it's not really your fault you know the things that happen to you and things like that. But we also have to remember that, you know, the things that we go through, they're a part of our life's journey and it may not be, you know, our response. It may not be our issue because it happened to us, but it's our responsibility that we heal from it because we have to put in that work. And the only way we're going to put in that work is to address those issues head on to confront, you know, those generational curses and demons and things like that that are plaguing our family in our community and once we get to that place then we'll be able to free up a lot of people so i know my role my book really just for me and like you said a lot of the stuff in my book i touch on the fact that i tried to commit suicide in my book but i don't really go into detail with it you know and things like that and that's what we do even as a society but then it's like we'll put something else on top of it that makes it look like it was not that significant you know and that's what you like you said we wear the mask you know and we have that mask on it's like yeah i tried to commit suicide but then i did this and this like that so i put something else on top of it that diminishes the fact that you know i try to take my own life you know and things like that and we do that so often that it becomes um it becomes normal you know yeah i was molested yeah i was in a domestic violence situation but this happened and this is, or we tried to come up with the reasons why it happened to us, you know, and things like that. And so I think that's just another thing we just have to teach even, you know, young people, we have to have some type of outlet. Writing poetry was my outlet to release every feeling, every anger, everything that was going on with me as I was growing up. But a lot of times our children don't have that outlet and we have to sometimes create that outlet for them so that they can release those things, you know, that are in those thoughts. We have some kids who looks like they have a perfect home, mother, dad, and home, and they're dealing with depression. They're dealing with suicidal thoughts because there's still something that's missing. And it's so easy for them to say, oh, I really don't know what it is. And it's not that they don't know what it is. It's just that they don't want to address it and bring it to the forefront. 
Amen. Amen. So. Sometimes we have both parents in the home, but that relationship mm -hmm. is not there. That communication is not there. Those <clears throat> things that you need, that affection, the, that emotional support. And if, if the, it's not in the home, then they're seeking elsewhere. And if if we if we're not affirming our kids and letting our kids know that they are loved and they are somebody and they are more than enough, then of course they're gonna seek these things outside the home and they're gonna seek them wherever they can seek them. And if they have things going on in the inside, they're gonna result to other things. They're gonna start smoking marijuana. They're gonna start drinking. They're gonna start doing whatever. Start being sexually active. And I'm just I'm just throwing out things that I did when I was younger because that's what I did when I was going through those things. You know what I'm saying? And that's what happened. And you know, mm -hmm. and we have to own our truth. And sometimes we hide the fact that things have happened to mm -hmm. us. And those things that are inside of us sometimes yeah. can trickle down to our kids and we got to stop that we got we got to stop allowing things that have mm -hmm. affected us to affect um our babies and those that are around us so it's very important that we deal with self and i tell you during this pandemic um mm -hmm. god has really been dealing with me with evaluating me and finding out and discovering and activating those things that I need to activate in my life because I've been knowing what my purpose was for a long time, but I just ain't been doing it for whatever reason it has been. Um, a lot was fear, but I come to realize and, and, and God revealed to me about fear. The only thing I should fear is him. That's the only thing I should fear because he said in the word of God, he didn't give us a spirit of fear. So it's very important that we pour into our kids and speak I think it light. also goes I think it also goes back to our childhood um, where you know and I can remember so many times when I was told you know well just go sit down and be quiet you know <laughs> or go go ahead you know I'd, I'd be like well I, I have some I don't care what you have to say you know and things like that the things that we say you know to our children and not just our children, but just the other people, you know, like, well, I said this and that's what it is. And so then kids take that and they internalize it. And so when it's time for them to say something, they don't, don't say anything because nobody's ever cared what they had to say. Or they've always been told to go sit down and be quiet, you know. And so then they draw up and they become quiet and they internalize the pain until it explodes, till they get to the point where I can't handle it inside of here anymore. So let me go ahead and take myself out of it like that's the only way i can deal with is if we're in this world you know and kids exactly. or have traumatic events that they deal with and they have traumatic events that they deal with and we think that it's taboo like you said you went through counseling you went through therapy you know we have kids who you know lose their lose maybe one of their parents or you know when they are young or something they need therapy they need to talk to someone you know, we as a community and as a people think that, oh, you know, black people don't go to the psychiatrist. You know, black people don't go to therapy and things like that. And and and, and, and it's it's ironic that you say that because I did lose my mom. I lost my mom twelve days before my um, twelve days actually after my sixteenth birthday. Um, and my dad wasn't really active in my life. But do you think anybody thought about sending me to counseling? Nobody thought about that. You know, and mm -hmm. there were a lot of things that I experienced my junior and mm -hmm. senior year um, in high school that I don't think I should have experienced as a teenager or as a child. Um, but that's things that I had to endure. Um, I didn't understand them then, but I understand them now because they have made me who I am today. They helped mold my character and make me into the person that I am. So I thank God for that journey. You know, I didn't understand it then. And there's probably people that are tuned in and people that are going to listen to this that may be in the same place. But I want them to know that, you know, God loves them and he created each and every one of us unique and fearfully and wonderfully in our own unique way that there's no other person out there like us. And he made us in his mm -hmm. image. So that means that we are perfectly made in his image, in his sight. Forget what other people think, because it does not matter. He's the only person that can judge us. 
So what other people think about us, it does not matter. And we have to get our babies and our kids to understand that. We have to get people to understand that in this world, that you are entitled to your choices. You are entitled to your opinion. And it does not matter what people think about you. And you have to you got to get them to instill in themselves that they are loved. Mm -hmm. And once some mm -hmm. once somebody can love themselves, they're able to love their neighbors. They love, they're able to love and pass that on to their community. And that's what we need right now. So I know you're mighty quiet over there, sir. <laughs> I, I, I um, just want to hear some of your input because I okay. think you are amazing. You, you have a portfolio for this world. So I, um, I want to hear some you. of your insight. <laughs> um, I was just writing some things down as you and Cassandra were speaking. And um, if I could just go through that list. Of the reasons why your initial question of why we in the brown community um, and as people of color don't always seek um, help. And I was just listing my reasons for why for myself, as well as other individuals that I've spoken to in the community, as well as being a facilitator and a member of a mental health organization. And so going down that list, what I wrote down first was spirituality. I think that sometimes because we feel that for those that grow up in church or in that setting, that life is such a blessing that it's such this horrible thing to not understand that blessing and to not want to be breathing. And so there's this subconscious decision I think sometimes we make that we feel even worse for even having the thought of self-harm because you're taught that life is so beautiful. And so it, it you find yourself conflicted. And so from the spiritual perspective, I find that to be one of my reasons. Um, mentally, there's this understood thing that we really have to stop doing and passing down, which is that silence is strength. Whether that is domestic violence, sexual assault, abuse, whatever the case may be, strength, I'm sorry, silence has been seen as strength for so long. When people need to understand the level of strength that it takes to say, hey, I need help. And to, to have to be that bold, to put yourself first when you face so much discrimination, not necessarily even from outside people, but from family members and friends that do not understand why what happens in this house can no longer stay in this house. That's a hard thing sometimes to digest because a lot of times you become either the first or the black sheep once you decide to seek help for yourself. And so it keeps us sometimes silenced. Um, historically, when looking at slavery and oppression, we were silenced. People died for speaking up, for advocating, for fighting for themselves. Um, all these other things that happened and were consequences definitely further silenced us as individuals and as people of color. And so there's just so many layers that um, we need to be able to digest. And I think also Angela, as you stated, sometimes we downplay the things that we've been through. And so we internalize and then we downplay. And so we, when we're teeter-tottering on the line of, should I get help? Should I not get help? Should I get help? Should I not get help? Um, we almost feel the need to start apologizing for the fact that I'm talking about my experience, but my experience was affected by other individuals. So now it's me telling everyone's business as it's no. These things affected me negatively. And for me to be able to move on in my life, I need to be able to speak upon these situations and these things that should have happened. And that it's not about exposure. It's more so about me being able to have conversation that with someone who can further dissect um, what has happened or taken place in my household so that I can let go of the guilt and get back to not being adjacent to my purpose, as you stated, and, and not participating in such toxic traits, habits, or relationships 
but looking within to find what I need to find a state in my homeostasis of wellness. And I just found that to be one of the biggest reasons within the African-American community, because historically we always talk about slavery and oppression, but we don't always talk about the shackles that we put on each other when it comes to having to choose between yourself and someone else, because then it looks like you're blaming someone, but that's not the case. And so um, one thing I definitely learned when it came to mental health was the first step I had to take was that realization and affirmation that putting myself first was not selfish. And that selfish and misunderstanding people had that ideology that I should not speak up and were more concerned about how it made them look than my actual well-being. And so a lot of those individuals ended up being removed because it just spoke volumes. And what I did find is that in my mental health journey, when I started to actually speak about mental health and my journey and depression and suicide and all those things, um, me now being published and also being a spoken word artist as well, um, and being in my last semester of my MED in higher education program, I just felt such the need to speak up because I finally understood the responsibility when God literally hands you the pen or the microphone. For those of us that are writers or speakers, there is such a responsibility. And this is not a job, it's not a career, it's in essence a ministry. It is a calling that requires you to be so transparent, but it's not really about you. It is you being crucified to stand in front of those that will come behind you and need a piece of your story in your journey because we're connected not so much by our careers and our lives on this platform it's our stories and our pain that really bonded us because there's an understanding and a respect of I understand your journey of domestic violence and everything that you've been through and the strength that it took for you to actually speak up, whether that was, you know, the 10 or 15 years ago, as you mentioned, or today sharing more of your story, because in due time, you'll continue you to share that story. But I'm thankful to know that I'm not the only one. And that's what it took because oftentimes we isolate and bury ourselves because we feel like we're the only ones. And so then when we're at the step where it's like, hey, I want something different. This this that I've been doing is not working for me. I, I, I can't keep teeter tottering between whether or not I want to live. And then we speak to a family member or someone close to us and it's like, well, you should be silent because you know this person's gonna be upset, this person's gonna be mad, this person's gonna be pissed, you're betraying this person. And so you're like, well, I guess I should be silent. But being able to have individuals such as the both of you to say, no, I've, I've, I've been through this, I understand, I'm now advocating you with your magazine, your platform, your radio show, and you as well as an educator, you understand the responsibility and you shed light in a world of grace. And that's the best thing that we can do for someone dealing with mental health and seeking mental wellness. I can't take the pain away from you, but I can be exemplification to show that you can move beyond the place that you're in and get that's to it. a place of wellness. That's it, that's it, that's and it. So that's just I my tell you. And I was gonna say, and I share my story with my students, like, mm -hmm. Yeah, at the beginning of the year, day one, I tell them, you know, hey, I, I've, I've been a victim of domestic violence. You know, mm -hmm. I was in a, a very abusive marriage, you know, um, for a while. Hey, I've been a, I've been molested. You know, I tried mm -hmm. to commit suicide. I participated in a gang. You know, I tell my students this and they're amazed and they say, you know, well, um, and it's crazy that the things that they say, like, well, you couldn't have tried to commit suicide because you wouldn't be here today. And I was like, yeah, because I wasn't successful, you know, but mm -hmm. um, just to be able to be that open with them because and then I tell them because there's some somebody who's sitting in this classroom today who's dealing with those same issues. 
whether you've already that. dealt with it or you're Absolutely. going to go through it. And you need to know mm -hmm. that, look, you can make it like, hey, you're my teacher standing in mm -hmm. front of me. And she went through all. I didn't just go through one of them. Some kids only go right. through molestation. You know, some kids only go mm -hmm. through abuse or homelessness. I went through all of it and I was going through a lot of it simultaneously. I was going mm -hmm. through a lot of it simultaneously. So it was very easy for me to ball up into a ball and say, you know, forget it. You know, I didn't try to attempt suicide until after my mom passed away. I was 19 years old, getting ready to turn 20. And I felt like at that point that my mom, my relationship with my dad was very off. You know, we didn't really have a relationship at that point. We have a great one now. But at that point, when my mom left this earth, I felt like that was all I had. Like she was gone. There was no reason for me to be here. But then, you know, it brought back to me and I had raised my brothers and sisters. And that's what kept me, you know, my, my younger brothers and sisters. Yeah. And I thank God that, you know, he put it on my heart. Even at the moment that I was attempting to slip my wrist with the other hand, I was calling my best friend and telling her that mm. I was slitting my wrist, you know, and that was my cry out out for help and you know, so ha and they always came over my house and just so happened that particular day i had came in the house um and i had come from the grocery store and i left my door unlocked and so my best friend like ran and she she couldn't get to me so she called like another one of them and they came to my rescue and you know thinking back on it you know like we laugh and joke now because it was such a dull razor. It's like, you weren't trying to mm -hmm. kill yourself for real. But I really was at a point where I was like, I don't want to be here. You know, you my mom had it. just passed two. Yeah. yeah, my mom had just passed two months before. Mm -hmm. And the relationship I was in was okay, but it wasn't something I looked for in long term. And I was just like, you know what? Forget it. You know, mm -hmm. I've been dealing with all this stuff anyway. Let's just, let's just end it now. And so I just thank God that, you know, he put it on my hard for me to reach out and, and they were able to get mm -hmm. there you know in time and it was the only time that I've tried to attempt suicide but I also know that that was also a part of my purpose and being able to now be able to minister to somebody it's one thing to tell somebody oh well I'm going to pray for you and I'll be here with you mm -hmm. because as a license as a licensed minister God will put me in a position where I may not have gone through that situation but I can minister to you through the Holy Spirit but it's a difference when my testimony, I can minister to you through my own personal testimony. And the Holy Absolutely. Spirit is going to reveal to me and have me say things as well. But this is my personal testimony. I stood in this and I survived mm -hmm. from this. And I didn't go to therapy or anything, but it's not because I didn't need it. But it's because at that point, I just thought that, you know, okay, I tried to kill myself. Let me go on. At that time, I was, I was a school teacher. I was successful. I was young and everything. I was going into like, I didn't, it, to everybody else, it looked like, what are you trying to kill yourself for? But to mm -hmm. me, there was nothing to live for. So. Absolutely. And I can definitely, uh, this is such an emotional um, show and I can definitely relate to your story. Um, I'll, I'll share this. Y'all see the tears, um, right? I mean, y'all see yes. the tears. <laughs> um, if you but can I'm see smiling, I have this. I have this tattoo, it says visionary um, on my okay. wrist, on my left wrist. And the reason why I got that tattoo was because every time that I picked up a knife and thought of self-harm and just how close I got and just the psychological of you being able to feel your veins, the blood, and, and, and just anticipating such this thing. Um, and, I, and I got this because the vision of my life's purpose is what kept me. And so as Angela was saying, like when you start to understand your purpose and not just your purpose, but your heavenly father saying to you, there's a moment in your life where you understand that you're worth every sacrifice and every fight. And that from the spiritual perspective, when it came to the crucifix and the cross. And we look spiritually, not to get too deep, but just psychologically reminding ourselves that for those of us that are believers that Jesus literally carried his cross. He knew that he had this responsibility and could have turned around at any point, could have changed his mind. But I, I, I take, um, pride in knowing that at some point, one of those nails, one of those reasons why 
he did not get down was because of you, you, and me. And what I mean by that is that our mistakes have already been counted for. And I don't want to say mistakes, so excuse me, but our actions have already been accounted for. And one thing I've learned is that when you're that close to death, it'll teach you how to live because you can't go back. There's no, that your life is just never the same after that, but it, it's something when you can take the ashes and turn that into something beautiful. And I've definitely learned, and I thank you for sharing your story so authentically, because I've definitely learned that the dirt that's thrown on us is the same thing that in turn waters us plants us and allows us to grow. Because when talking about speaking and advocating and being an author without those experiences, I wouldn't be here. And I'm sure that's true for part of your story and part of your platform. And so I'm thankful that I've been redirected and that I live to see the value of my life and to understand why I was created and why I still had to be here. And that's one of the things that I've had to like take and learn. And I just remember like the one thing that always has stuck with me is that we had like a preacher come in one time and she was preaching a service. And I mean, I say this all the time. Like she, what she said was that, you know, God already knew the things that we were going to go through yeah. and he had, he had already walked the path. Mm -hmm. of he our life before, before he even created us mm -hmm. and every everything that was going to destroy us everything that was going to take us down mm -hmm. everything that was going to cause us death he kicked it out of the pathway and so everything mm -hmm. that was left there was for our good so once i heard her say that it started taking me back to everything that i had been through and for me to just say you know that was for my good I, i've been through that but it was for my good and so that's my attitude I, yeah i went through that but it was for my good because God already knew I was going to go through it. And so he knew on August the 20, he knew on August the 26th, 1999, that I was going to attempt my life, attempt to take my mm -hmm. own life, you know, and he knew who to put strategically in place to rescue me on that day. And so I just thank mm -hmm. God for that. And I keep that message. Like if I don't remember anything else I've ever heard, I've ever heard in church, I've May not remember every sermon that has ever been preached to me, but I remember <laughs> that nugget. You know, yeah. I remember okay. that nugget that that pastor preached, and she a very that important in. one. It was it was yes, for you to has, digest. Yes, and that has been my grab. That has been my takeaway, and I say it, mm -hmm. and I give it. I tell it to my kids. I'd be like, listen, if God didn't think you can go through it, He wouldn't have put it there. You know, He would have kicked it out the way. If it was gonna kill, it's not gonna kill you. Just go through it. You know. It's going to hurt. You know, it hurt. <laughs> I tell you guys, I, I thank God for each one of you in your own respective way. Because I tell you, it's not easy going before people and being transparent and sharing. Um, I thank God for all of my platforms because it gives me an opportunity to bring individuals like you guys. Y'all are so amazing. Your journey. No, we did not understand why we was going through. I'm saying just sitting here listening to both of you guys talk and share bits and pieces of your story. I saw me. Everybody that come on my platform, I can see parts of my life in them. And that's the connection that God is making. He's allowing me to, to share with people and to let those that are listening that's going through know that they're not in this alone, that we all have been there. And he's allowing me a platform to showcase people and to put people on the spotlight so people can see that other people been where you are. People been where you're going. Listen to them. They can help you get where you need to go. Mm -hmm. We didn't go through these things for no reason. It was a reason for everything that we went through. If we had not went through those things, you know, we often ask that question. What if, what if this had happened? What if this had happened? You know, we always, we, we wonder because I used to do it a lot. And let me share something with you guys on my, on my little thing right here. One day I was sitting, I had posted on Facebook. What if Wednesday? It was Wednesday. I said, what if Wednesday? Because everybody always talking about hump day Wednesday. I said, what if Wednesday? Mm -hmm. I said, 
what if what is your what if and people started posting all kind of stuff on facebook and it went into a long drawn out conversation back and forth we was just chatting all day that night i had to do my show i do a monthly show on one of my own um, platforms so i had to do my show so i asked that question again well my brought my producer of my network he commented on my post and i commented about his comment because if that young man had a quit broadcasting in 2016 when he wanted to give up y'all wouldn't be right here right now on this platform sharing i wouldn't be sitting right here because i wouldn't have had the opportunity to even be commissioner for damon speaks to even have this platform i wouldn't even be in a position to reach two million people on my show live i think it was i was 26. two million people tuned into my show two million people i was the first host in network history since 2013. if he had gave up and call it quits i would have never had that chance I would have never had that chance to bring those individuals on to share their story, to share their testimony, to share their journey. I would have never reached those two million people and y'all wouldn't be sitting right there sharing your story. So I'm glad he chose the other what if. The what if I choose this route and mm -hmm. not that. He didn't give up. And somebody tonight, I want you to hear what I wrote. Cause that day I was battling. I, I I was constantly thinking about those what ifs. So I started to write all of my what ifs down, and I thought about how many it really was. I stopped because it was a lot, and I just began to praise God because every time I wanted to give up or try to end my own life, God said, "No, daughter, I have more for you. Even though you don't see it, trust me. Trust me." And that's what we got to do. Faith. We got to have faith. No, he never said it was going to be easy. And see, that's what we get. It confused. When you was talking about spiritual, it took me back because a lot of us, we grew up in the church. That's how we know it's church. Mm -hmm. But the church ain't really in us. We have all right. the, 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 the biblical teaching. We have all the scriptures. We can quote scriptures like the back of our hand. But we don't have that relationship with God and we're not mm -hmm. living a life that's pleasing to him. Because, why? Because we live in fear. A lot of us live in fear. I know I did. I thought if, mm -hmm. I didn't want to fail him. That was my biggest thing was mm -hmm. failing him. I'm telling you, I went to church all the time. I don't care. Even when I was in the clubs and used to go to the club. I went to my party all night long. Yeah. I left that club. Sunday morning. I went to church. I don't care if I went and what I had on. I went to church. And I was a Sunday school teacher. Left the club and went and taught the kids Sunday school. And went. But you know what? We did what we was doing. God kept us in the midst of what we was doing. And we was getting that because one day, one day he knew there was going to be people that we was going to have to minister to. Even I'm not a minister. I don't proclaim to be nobody. I'm just Angela. I just go <laughs> on what what he's done for me in my life and my relationship. I don't. I have no titles, no nothing. I love my pastor. He's a wonderful man. He's taught me well. He, he's a great teacher. And, and I'm a good student and I just lo I love to learn and I love to share. And God has been good because I tell you, I was shot. I was shot point blank range with a shotgun. May 7th, 2014. Doctor said it would be years before I walked, if I ever walked again. I'm here to tell y'all. When I came out of surgery, they say I had been in surgery for six hours. Came out of surgery. My dad was right there beside me. And I'm going to share my full testimony one day. My dad was right there beside me. My dad never left my side. My dad passed away um, day before Mother's Day last year. Um, and he stayed there with me. Those people came in the room from physical therapy. And they asked me if I wanted to walk. They had a, a walker and everything.
they took me and they said, we're going to walk down to, they said, we're going to walk down to the nurse station. So we walked to the nurse station. We got to the nurse station. And so we kept going. And I haven't looked back since. I haven't went to physical therapy. I hadn't done nothing, y'all. And that's been six years ago. So can't nobody tell me what my God can do. I know my God. He's amazing. Wow. And if he'll do it for me, he'll do it for anybody. Because he said he has no respectable person. He has no respectable person. So I want to thank you guys for coming on. Um, before we close, I want to give you guys an opportunity because I know both of you guys are authors. I want to give you guys an opportunity to share your platforms and how um, individuals can um, connect with you to purchase your book. Um, if you have a website, share your website because um, <clears throat> I take pride in my platform and networking and I love to network. I love to share. So I'm going to be um, downloading downloading this um, video to all of my platforms. I'm going to be sharing it across um, my um, circle of influence because you guys have been truly a blessing. I also want to um, invite you guys. I, I'm doing a 24 hour marathon on October the 1st for domestic violence. Um, I'm going to be up 24 hours. I'm not going to sleep because we have to take a stand. I'm here in South Carolina and we, we constantly rate between one and five, between one and five in domestic violence. And it's unacceptable when we rank number 50 in education. There's something seriously wrong with that picture. And it's time that we take a stand. And as a domestic violence survivor, I chose to use my platform to speak out against domestic violence. And I'm staying up 24 hours. I have some amazing co-hosts that are gonna come on and co-host with me so I don't get sleepy. And if I need to take a nap, they're gonna be right there to co-host for me if I have to take a nap, but I don't think I'm gonna need a nap <laughs> because I'm, 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 I'm working for the Lord and I believe he's gonna give me the strength to endure. But I have some amazing guests, um, co-hosts that are gonna be on, co-hosts and I actually have a co-host that's going to be coming on from Germany. She's going to be on for four hours. They're coming on for three and four hours at a time. Some of them are bringing their own guests. So they're, they're going to flood my platform. I just want individuals to pop in and out. If you can't come and stay 30 minutes, if you can just come five minutes and talk about your book, say hello and just say something about domestic violence. That's all I want because I want to get the word out because it's time that we take a stand. I'm tired of things affecting our community and people just washing it under the rug and just letting it go, just sweeping it under the rug. They don't talk about it until it hit mm -hmm. their home. But mm -hmm. we're going to talk about it because it's affecting our community and it's affecting us badly. Not in a positive way. But we need to turn that around. We need to turn that around. We need to teach love and we need to empower people so that they know that they are loved. So let let. I want y'all to share. We're going to let Cassandra share about her book and how to get in contact with her first, and then I'm going to bring you back up. Okay. All right. Okay, well, um, I am on Facebook, um, and my name on Facebook is Cassandra Edwards, E-D-W-A-R-D-S. Um, and that's really the only platform that I'm really, really on. I have an Instagram my Instagram is Cassie May nine eight, um, and but I don't really be on there, um, and I don't even know what my Twitter tag is. So that shows you how much I'm on there. Um, I am an author of um, a book, um, Unsolicited Tears. Um, this is a picture of the cover. I don't know if you all can really see that, but um, you can find it on Amazon, um, Barnes and Noble, or you can reach out to me via Facebook. Um, I have copies at home that I do still ship out and things like that. Um, the book is $15. Um, and it's really my life story. Um, it's um, it's really a vignette. So there are short stories from my life. And then there are also poems that follow each one of the stories. And then there's a special dedicated portion of the story that I do tributes and things like that um, in the actual novel. So that is my... Um, my book. I also just worked with a collab and I told more of my story of being molest molested. Um, I do have, have a um, domestic violence um, story that I am going to come out with. I'm not really sure how I'm going to publish that yet, uh, but that is something that I am looking at. So um, 
October the 1st is my birthday. Um, <laughs> and so I will join in on the domestic violence um, thing for, I'm not sure how long, but I will be on. Um, you can just of, stop uh, by actual, and uh, say hello. Uh, and what you doing. However you want to grace the platform, it will be great. <laughs> I just want people to be able to share and people to be able to get their message out because there are people hurting. And I tell you, when I was struggling with domestic violence, it wasn't a lot. And when I decided to step away, people told me they were going to be there for me and they were not there for me. And it was a hurt feeling. And um, I've right. come in contact with a lot of people that have resources that can help people. And I want them to be able to um, put them um, resources on the forefront so that people can know that these resources are available, that these people are available. Because there may be people on my platform mm -hmm. that need to reach out to you or need to reach out to somebody else that come on the platform. I may not be the person that they meet, need to reach out to. But if you never come to okay. the platform and support the platform, nobody will never know who you are. So that's why I'm so open with my platform. I don't care who grace it. Because I know I know the plans that God has for me because he declared it in Jeremiah 29 and 11 and nobody can change those That's plans. Right. So it don't bother me. That's why I network. That's why I collaborate. That's why I partner. That's why I do what I do. So I, I love to share. So I want you to stop by and share as long as you like and um, oh, let people know who you are because you definitely have a message and your message needs to be heard. Yes. So I thank you. So I'm going to bring up our Mr. North Carolina so he can share um, <laughs> before we close out. Um, share a little bit. Don't go nowhere, Cassandra, because I'm going to, before we close out, okay? I, I, I want you to pray us out before we leave, okay? I'm going to do some things a little different. Okay. Um, I so my book, um, I do have a copy with me, Men in Mental Health. Um, as you can see, this is volume two, series three, I'm sorry. And you can find the book on Amazon Kindle and um, you can buy a hard copy as well. Um, in terms of my social media handles, I have my website, dimprisgaskew.com. My Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter are all dimprisgaskew, so it's relatively easy to find me. So for anyone wanting more information, whether it's to book for speaking engagements or whatever the case may be, or just to follow everything that I do regarding mental health and education, um, you can reach me at dimprisgaskew. So thank you. Well, I definitely want to thank you guys for sacrificing your Sunday afternoon, evening, I mean, evening and coming on and sharing because um, I definitely have been blessed. I have been blessed. I tell you, anytime tears roll, there's tears of joy. Know that they weren't sad tears, they were tears of joy. So I tell you, it's, it's good when you can smile and cry at the same time because I definitely have been blessed. I have been blessed by you guys. Um, you guys are welcome to my platform anytime. Um, anytime I have, and you see me posting about interviews, you're welcome to come on and share because I tell you, you have a message that needs to be shared. But before we leave, um, I want um, Cassandra to pray us out um, because someone out there, um, they, they, they may need prayer. They, they may need some guidance. They may need something. And I just want you to pray um, before we leave tonight. Uh, Father God, in the name of Jesus, we, we thank you for this platform that you have given unto Angela. We thank you for each and every guest that has come on. We thank you for every listener who was listening on tonight. Father God, we bind up the hand of the enemy that may wish to come and throw out their purpose because of the things that were spoken out on today. Father God, we bind the hand of the enemy that we, may wish to bring even suicidal thoughts unto some of the listeners because of the things that they heard and the things that we dispatched out. Father God, we cover them with your blood. In the name of Jesus, oh God, Father God, we release, oh God, your spirit, Father God, of peace and joy to rest, rule, and abide in them. In the name of Jesus, oh God, Father God, we thank you, oh God, that our testimonies will bring healing unto the people, Father God, for nations and nations to come. In the name of Jesus, oh God, Father God, we thank you, oh God, that the purpose, oh God, that you have placed down on the inside of each and every one of us will be fulfilled. In the name of Jesus, oh God, we thank you, oh God, that you're reassuring your people that no matter what they've been through, Father God, that you have always been with them, that you have never left nor forsaking them, and you will be with them as they continue to go through, oh God. So, Father God, we thank you, oh God, Father God, that they will look to you. And, Father God, they won't look to man. They won't have to fall and depend on anyone else. But, Father God, they will fall into your bosom. Father God, and rest 
there, oh God. And Father God, we thank you, oh God, for giving them peace that surpasses all understanding. No matter what the situation is that they have dealt with, no matter what things may be going on in their lives at this particular time, Father God, we thank you, oh God, that you're still able, oh God. Father God, we thank you that you are their refuge, and we thank you that you are their strength. And Father God, we just ask, oh God, as we depart off of this line, oh God, Father God, that you cover, oh God, each and every person, oh God. Father God, we spend us, we send your word, oh God, to the people, oh God, who are listening, that your spirit will rest in their homes, oh God. In the name of Jesus, oh God, Father God, we thank you for divine alignment, oh God, for their purposes in your life. Father God, we come against, oh God, any attacks of the enemy, oh God, that wishes to cause confusion and disruption, oh God, because they have tuned in, oh God. And Father God, we thank you, oh God, that your fullness of joy will rest in them, oh God. And Father God, we just thank you, oh God. We bless you, oh God. We give you honor, oh God, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I tell you, I thank you for that prayer. And I pray that you guys that have tuned in have been blessed because I tell you, I definitely have been blessed. I pray that you um, <clears throat> have been encouraged on tonight. And if anyone would like to connect with these individuals, if you're going through something, if you need to reach out, please reach out. We're here. We're here. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm open. My, my, my platform is always open. My um, business line is posted on my page. So if you need to reach out, please reach out. We're here. We don't come on and share our stories for nothing. We're here to assist because we want you to walk in your purpose. I love you guys and thank you for your sacrifice on tonight. If I can be of any assistance, please feel free to reach out to my platform anytime. I love you. Guys. Absolutely. Thank you as well. I love you too. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So you guys have been tuned in to Walk in Purpose with Angela um, Damon looks. I thank God for my wonderful producer, Brother O, for allowing me this platform to come on and to be able to bring in individuals on through video um, to share on our platform. So thank you, Brother O, for this opportunity. I tell you, I don't take these opportunities lightly. Anytime God gives me the opportunity to come before you guys and to share someone's story, to share someone's testimony in hopes to educate, empower, and encourage you to walk in your purpose. I've done what I need to do. And I thank my guests for coming on and being transparent. We love you guys. Be blessed. If you need us, please reach out. We're here. We're here to serve. We are servant leaders here to serve you. Y'all be blessed. I love you guys.